Welcome to this video on numerical solutions of partial differential equations in one dimension. By the end of this video, you will be able to solve PDEs using numerical methods. So when we are talking about numerical solution for PDEs, since the PDEs contain derivatives, we have to use finite differences. And the overall solution procedure can be summarized in just four steps. First, we will discretize all spatial independent variables into a so-called mesh or grid. Then we will replace the spatial partial derivatives with finite difference formulas. Then we will incorporate the initial and boundary conditions that are given by the PDE problem. And then finally, we will solve the resulting system of ODEs, because this process will turn our PDE into a system of ordinary differential equations. So I'm going to use an example uh, to explain these four steps. And the example will be the one-dimensional heat equation where on the left-hand side we have the derivative of temperature with respect to time is equal to alpha times the second derivative of temperature with respect to the spatial dimension x. Now when we solve this PDE we have to provide a solution domain. So we're interested in the solution for time being greater or equal to zero, but we also now have to provide a spatial domain because space x is one of the independent variables. So here we're interested in the solution in a domain that goes from zero to some variable uppercase L. For a PDE like this that contains time, we have to provide an initial condition. And in this case here, the initial condition at time equal to zero along the spatial direction x is just some given analytical function f of x. But also, we have to provide two boundary conditions, one at each end in the spatial direction. So one at x equal to zero, one at x equal to l. So let's use the following. Let's say we have an adiabatic boundary at x equal to zero, which would mean that the partial derivative of temperature with respect to space x at the left bound x equal to zero for all times t is equal to zero. And let's say at the other end of the domain at x equal to l, we hold the temperature equal to zero. So those are our boundary conditions. Now, first up, is this a homogeneous PDE? Well, it turns out, yes, it is. So that means that uh, the temperature remaining zero for all times is actually a solution, but it's not a very interesting solution. Now, analytical solutions can be found with the method of separation of variables, but here we're interested in finding the numerical solution. Okay, so let's do the four steps. Step number one is discretize the spatial independent variables into a mesh or grid. And the term mesh and grid are used interchangeably here. So we have a solution domain in the x direction, in the space direction, that goes from zero to L. And we're going to divide this solution domain into m equally sized subintervals. So here's my solution domain that starts at zero and has a length of L. And we are just going to subdivide this into equally sized subintervals. The size of each subinterval, or the spacing between adjacent points, in this case, this case they're called grid points or mesh points, is then simply delta x equal to the length L divided by the number of subintervals m. We can calculate the location for a grid point i by simply doing i minus one times delta x. And i would go in MATLAB notation from one, i equal to one at the left bound of the, of the domain at x equal to zero, to x sub m plus one at the right bound of the domain, x sub m plus one would be equal to l. And we can calculate any intermediate grid point location by simply doing i minus one times delta x. Now, how would we do this in MATLAB? Well, in MATLAB, I suggest you just use the 
linspace command, where the first argument is the starting coordinate, the last argument is the ending coordinate, and then the third argument is the number of points that we have. Now, because we have m subintervals, that means we have m plus 1 points. Now, the linspace command in MATLAB returns a row vector, but it's preferable, at least for me, to work with column vectors, so therefore there's this little apostrophe here at the end, which means transpose the row vector into a column vector. So that makes it a column vector. Okay, so that's step one. Step two is replace the spatial partial derivatives with finite difference formulas. So what partial derivatives in space do we have? Well, in the PDE, there is the second derivative, right? And we can use any of the formulas that we learned in an earlier module. So for example, we could use a second order three-point central difference formula to evaluate this partial derivative. So that means what? Okay, so on the left-hand side, I still have dt dt, but now I'm evaluating this at mesh point i. And now here I have the spatial second derivative that I'm going to replace with the three-point central finite difference formula that is second order. That gives me alpha times ti plus 1 minus 2 times ti plus t sub i minus 1 divided by x, delta x squared. Now, note, this equation now for the grid point i is really no longer a PDE. It's an initial value ODE for the temperature at grid point i. Right? There's only one derivative with respect to one independent variable in this equation, the independent variable being time lowercase t. So let me write this as an ODE. So dt i dt is equal to the right-hand side is unchanged. So now I have to solve this ODE for every interior point, for every grid point. That means that the index i will have to go from 2 to 3 all the way to m. Why not for i equal to 1 and i equal to m plus 1? Well, because there we have boundary conditions. So what we've obtained now is a system of m minus 1 first order ODEs. Now, there's one more spatial uh, partial derivative in this problem. And that one appears in the boundary condition at the left edge of the domain. There, the first derivative is equal to zero. Since this is a partial derivative in space, we have to use a finite difference formula for this as well. So we could, for example, use a second order three point forward formula. Now, because this is at a boundary condition, we are kind of constrained which formulas we can use because there must be mesh points to use in our finite difference formula. If we're at the left boundary, that naturally forces us to use forward differences. If the boundary condition is at the right boundary, that forces us to use backward finite differences. Here we're at the left boundary, so we use forward differences, and we're going to use a second order approximation, so the three-point forward formula, which is the approximation for dt dx at i equal to 1, right? i equal to 1 is my boundary point at the left, and that formula was from the earlier module, negative 3 times t1 plus 4 times t2 minus t3 divided by 2 delta x. And that's the formula that you get from the table if you plug in i is equal to 1. Okay, and the boundary condition says this has to be equal to zero. Okay, third step is incorporate the initial and the boundary conditions. Well, let's start by setting the initial dependent variable values. Now, here's the initial condition from the problem statement that the temperature should be equal to some analytical function at the location x. So we need to set this initial value for all interior points. We don't need to set it really at the boundaries because for that we have boundary conditions as we will see here in a second. So we have to set the vector t sub i, the ith entry into the temperature vector t, using some given analytical function f evaluated at the location of the point x sub i and do this for i from 2 to m. <clears throat> 
Now, what do we do with the boundaries? Well, for the boundary values, we use the boundary conditions. So let's go back to that first boundary condition that we used a finite difference formula for to express the partial derivative in space. That one was minus 3t1 plus 4t2 minus t3 divided by 2 delta x is equal to zero. We want to use this to find out what is the temperature value at the first point at i equal to 1. Well, all we have to do is solve this equation for t1. That gives us t1 is equal to 4t2 minus t3 divided by 3. So the value at the boundary will depend on the values of temperature at neighboring mesh points. And then we have a second boundary condition. The temperature at the end point has to be equal to zero. The index location for the end point, it's the m plus first point, so it would be t sub m plus one is equal to, in this case, equal to zero. Now, comment on MATLAB. If we have boundary conditions, I strongly suggest that you code them in a separate function. Here, I've just called that function bc for boundary condition. And into that function, you pass in the current value of the independent variable, time, and the entire vector of, in this case, temperature value, so the vector of dependent uh, values. And you will then return out as an output argument the vector of dependent values with the boundary conditions applied. I strongly suggest you make this a function because we will need to use these boundary conditions at multiple points in our overall algorithm to solve PDEs. Okay, that was step three. Step four was solve the resulting systems of ODEs, or system of ODEs. So we already saw that we can convert the PDE into a system of ODEs that has to be solved at every mesh point. So that's expressed like this, right? DTI dt is the ODE for the temperature at the ith point is equal to some right-hand side function. Now that right-hand side function followed from the application of finite difference formulas to the spatial derivatives. And in this example here, the ith right-hand side is alpha times ti plus one minus two ti plus ti minus one divided by delta x squared. Now, we can apply any of the numerical techniques that we learned for ODEs. For example, any of the ranger kata methods. Let's keep it simple. Let's just use the RK1 method or forward Euler. Well, that said that the temperature, now that's the temperature in the entire vector along the entire mesh is equal to the temperature vector at the prior time plus time step size delta t times k1. And that k1 slope was simply the right hand side of the system of ODEs, that vector function, evaluated at the current time tn and the current temperature value vector uppercase tn. Now, all we need is a function f to calculate this right-hand side for the system of ODEs. And that's not new, right? We've done this in module 8 for systems of ODEs as well. So let's call this function my RHS, my right-hand side. And the input arguments from module 8 were the value of the independent variable time, and in this case now the vector of temperature values. And the output of this function should be, well, the right-hand side vector, f. Now, there's one thing that we have to be doing for PDEs that wasn't necessary for ODEs. fi, this vector right-hand side function, the values at the boundaries are irrelevant, what f is there. Why? Because we're not using the ODE to update the values at the boundaries. For that, we have boundary conditions. So we will only need to set the value of f for the interior points from 2 to m. We should still allocate, of course, the vector having m plus 1 entries. But those entries for the first point and the very last point at m plus 1, they can remain 0. Now, the other thing is that the right-hand side f 
near the boundaries can depend on boundary values, right? And that can be easily seen if we look at the right-hand side function fi up here and evaluate it for the second point, so i is equal to 2. Then this right-hand side fi contains t1, but t1 is my boundary value. So I have to make sure that I have the correct boundary value available to evaluate f2. So what you should do is you should apply the boundary conditions every time before calculating the right-hand side vector f. And the way to ensure this is, it, is to put this into the function to calculate the right-hand side directly. And as a first step, call the boundary condition function. Now, if f depends on variables other than just the time and the temperature, then they are not known through the argument list of my RHS. Instead, make those variables available as global variables. Okay, so once the new solution at the new time level n plus 1 is calculated, right, solving the ODE for the interior points, then we have to apply the boundary conditions as well using the new time t n plus 1 to make the boundary conditions consistent with our new solution in the interior of the mesh. Now what about stability, right? Because we saw for ODEs um, that for some ODEs there is a con stability constraint to, provide, uh, to prevent the solution going to infinity. Now for Explicit methods, for example, any of the Rangakata methods, they do require a limitation of the step size. What that limitation is, or the stable step size delta t itself, depends on the specific PDE that is being solved. So here, for the 1D heat equation, the Rangakata 1 method, the forward Euler method, is stable only if the step size in time, delta t, is smaller or equal to 1 half delta x squared divided by alpha. Now this particular constraint applies to most explicit methods. Um, it applies to any of the Rangakata methods. The only thing that um, might be a little bit different is the prefactor here for the RK1 method, it is one half. Any of the other higher order Rangakata methods might allow a larger prefactor, larger than one half. So if we use the condition for the RK1 method, we will be on the safe side and stable for any of the higher order RK methods as well. Now let's do an example. And we're going to do this by hand, and you'll see quickly that this is a long and tedious task, but it's worthwhile to do this at least once by hand, this entire procedure, before we jump into coding it and letting the computer solve it. So by hand, we're supposed to solve this PDE here using backward spatial differences and the RK1 method, so forward Euler, with a time step size, size of 0 0.1 and the spatial interval size of delta x equal to 1. Here's the solution domain in space, goes from 0 to 4, and we have a time domain that we start at t equal to 0. Here is the boundary condition at the left bound, y there is supposed to be equal to 1. And at the right bound, we have that the first derivative of y with respect to x at x equal to 4 is supposed to be equal to t, the current time. And then we have an initial condition y at x for time equal to 0 is equal to 1. Okay, so let's tackle the four steps. So step 1 was discre discretize, discretize spatial independent independent variables in this case there's only one into a mesh or grid and what's given in the problem right is this delta x is equal to 1 
So delta x is equal to 1. And what else is given? The length of the domain is 4. Right? That follows from here that x has to be between 0 and 4. OK, so with that, I can calculate the number of subintervals. That was uppercase m. Right? That has to be L divided by delta x. Before, we wrote this formula slightly differently, that delta x is equal to L over m. But if in our problem statements we have L and delta x given, we can, of course, use this formula to calculate m, the number of subintervals. So that's equal to 4 divided by 1, 4. OK, so let me uh, do a little sketch here of the domain. So I have we we'll start here and here. <clears throat> so here we have um, 0. And over here, right, we have um, an x value of 4. And we're supposed to have four subintervals. So let me make four equally sized subintervals in here. Right, so that would be 1, 2, 3, 4 subintervals. Each one of them here has a size of delta x equal to 1. And now I can generate my grid, my mesh, my x values. So I know x sub 1 is equal to 0. Here's my x sub 2, x sub 3, x sub 4, x sub 5. Right, I have four subintervals. That means I have five total points. And this x sub 5 here is equal to 2, 4. And at these locations here, I will then have my y sub 1, y sub 2, y sub 3, y sub 4, and y sub 5 as well. OK, step one done. Step number two, replace the spatial derivatives, spatial derivatives with finite differences. OK, so here it tells us what to use. We have to use a backward spatial finite difference. It doesn't really tell us which one of these formulas to use. Um, but let's keep it simple. Let's use just the first order backward one, the two-point formula. So I have to replace this dy dx with a finite difference formula. So I'm going to approximate this by backward differences, yi. So this difference at i minus yi minus 1 divided by delta x. And I know this is first order, right? Order delta x, proportional to delta x. That's the truncation error. Um, OK, let's substitute into the PDE. Substitute into the PDE. So what do I have? I have dy dt plus x squared dy dx. So that's yi minus yi minus 1 divided by delta x. Now, this formula here is valid at the grid point i, which means that all the other terms here in the PDE have to be evaluated at that point i as well. So I have to put in here the subscript indices to indicate that all terms are to be evaluated at the location i, or x sub i, in terms of the x value. That is equal to the right-hand side evaluated at i, so x sub i plus t. OK, good. Now I can turn this into a system of ODEs. System of ODEs. Right, I'm going to isolate the time derivative to one side. It's the only derivative left. So dy dt at i is equal to minus xi squared times yi minus yi minus 1 divided by delta x plus x sub i plus t. And this is now my system of ODEs. Right. OK, but there is one more spatial derivative that appears here in the boundary conditions. 
So I have to replace that derivative with a finite difference formula as well. So dy dx, where? At what index i? Well, it's at x equal to 4, and the index for x equal to 4 is i equal to 5. So at 5, and approximate this with backward differences, first order. So that would be y5 minus y4 divided by delta x. And that is supposed to be equal to, according to the boundary condition, t, my current time. Okay, good, that's step two. Step three, incorporate initial, initial and boundary conditions. Okay, so what do we have in terms of initial and boundary conditions here in the problem statement? Um, let's start with the uh, initial conditions. Here's my initial conditions at t equal to zero. So at every point, yi at the initial time, so the superscript is one, the value of y is equal to one. And I'm gonna do this for the interior points from two, three, all the way to m. All right, so I'm gonna set the initial values here, because I'm going to use the boundary conditions to set the values at the boundaries. So here that's my initial condition. And now let's do the boundary conditions. First boundary condition is this one here. y at x equal to 0, that's this one where the index is 1. So y1 for any time, so I'm going to keep the superscript general as n, right, because this equation here is valid for any time. The value there at the boundary is equal to 1. And then finally, I have the boundary condition at x equal to 4. So if I use that one, x, this one here, it's my boundary condition at x equal to 4 that I derived over here. So now this, where I use the finite difference formula to replace the first derivative, I now have to solve this for the boundary value, which is at i equal to 5. So I get y5 is equal to y4 plus delta x times t. Now for what times? Well, for any time, so let me put the superscript n onto the y values and of course the time value because that changes obviously with time as well. Okay, so let's mark this one here orange. That's where I got this from. And the other boundary condition, this one here was the sign one. Okay, so we've incorporated the initial and the boundary conditions so we can move on to step four. Step four was solve the resulting system of ODEs. ODEs. Okay, so what was that resulting system of ODEs? Well, I had, right, dy dt <coughs> at i is equal to some right-hand side function fi that depends on time and the vector of y values. In the prior slide, we found what that right-hand side f is, of t and y. That's equal to minus xi squared times yi minus yi minus 1 divided by delta x plus xi plus t. That's our right-hand side. Now, we have to pick a solution technique for the system of ODEs, but the problem says use RKOM, use forward Euler. So use RK1, or forward Euler, forward Euler, right? And the formula for forward Euler that we derived when we talked about ODEs is y is a vector now, right? Because we have these different values at the different mesh points. At the new time is equal to the y vector at the prior time n plus delta t times 
a slope k1. And for the rk1 method, the slope k1, it's a vector, right, because we have multiple mesh points, is simply equal to that right-hand side f evaluated at t and y, the vector of y values at n. So let's use the formula. So if I want to calculate k1 at the ith point, all I have to do is use this formula. So that's equal to minus xi squared yi minus yi minus 1 divided by delta x plus xi plus t. Me, oops, we remove this minus 1, that looks like I'm going to subtract 1, but the 1 is just subtracted in the index. And this has to be evaluated, right? This k1 in the rk1 method has to be evaluated at time n. Okay, so I'm going to use here the time level n y values and the time level n time. Okay, so that's my solution strategy. Now to solve this problem, I just have to apply this. Okay, so uh, let me take this equation here. So don't have to write this again and just copy this over here. Right, that's my k. And um, I have a table here that I can fill in with the correct values. I know first column here is my index. I know my index goes from 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And I know that my x values there are 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And at my time, for the initial time, t1 is equal to 0. And I can use the initial condition to fill in what the y vector would be at the interior points. Right? That was this condition here, that was this condition here, so the values are all 1, 1. And then I have the boundary condition that we just derived for the right boundary. Let me just write this again here. y5 was equal to y4n plus delta x times tn. Okay. So, and the boundary condition for the first point, y, 1, n, that was equal to 1. So let's put the boundaries in. So at the left, it's 1. At the right, I have to take the value at 4, so this guy here, right? And then I have 2 at delta x times t. But t1 is 0, so I have the value y4, which is 1 plus 0, so that gives me a boundary value of 1. Okay, that's my initial conditions. I applied the boundary conditions. Now I can start solving the system. So I'm going to start with n equal to 1. And if we do this by hand, it's, it's typically easiest to um, just calculate what the k values or the f values are first, right? And I have here a, um, a column in the table to fill that in. Calculate this f for the interior values, right? This is my f or my k1. So let's go. So I have to go for every interior i. So I have to start with f2. But before I do this, I need to apply the boundary conditions formally. Well, I just did this, right? Because I had the initial conditions and I applied the boundary conditions. So I'm Kind of okay with this because I already applied the boundary conditions before I calculate the right hand side. So f2 now of t1 and the vector y at superscript index 1 is equal to, well here's the formula, i equal to 2. So x minus x2 squared y2 1 minus y1 1, 1 divided by delta x plus x2 plus t superscript 1. That's my right-hand side. Let's plug in values. Minus x2, 
So here's my i, here is my x value at i equal to 2, that's 1. So minus 1 squared times y2, 1 minus y1, y2 minus y1, it's 1 minus 1, divided by delta x, delta x is 1, plus x2, I just had the x2, that's 1, plus the t1, the t1 here is 0, so plus 0. So that's 1 minus 1 is 0, plus 1 is 1, plus 0 is 1. So that, by, that result is the f at i equal to 2 is 1. So let me just mark this here in the table. And I have to repeat this for every interior point. So f3 at t1, the y vector at 1 is equal to minus x3 squared y3, 1 minus y2, 1 divided by delta x plus x3 plus t1. Got a little bit close here. Let me just move this down a little bit so we can keep the two equations apart. Okay, let's substitute in the values. Minus x3, i is equal to 3, x3 is equal to 2. So minus 2 squared times y3 minus y2, y3 minus y2. 1 minus 1 divided by delta x, which is 1, plus x3, which is 2, plus t1, which is 0. Okay, so that gives me 1 minus 1 is still 0 here, plus 2 plus 0 gives me 2. So that's equal to 2. Put this in here. And then finally f4 at t1 y vector at 1 is equal to, the index i is equal to 4, minus x4 squared times y4 1 minus y3 1 divided by delta x plus x4 plus t1 with the values x4 is equal to 3 minus 3 squared times y4 minus y3, 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1 divided by 1 plus x4 which is 3 plus t1 which is 0 gives me 3. That value is 3. And I don't need to calculate the right hand side, right, for the boundary points i equal to 1 and i equal to 5. Okay, so I've calculated um, f, the right-hand side, and thereby the k1 slope, and I can now apply my Rangakata 1 method. So I'm going to use rk1 for every interior point, which means that y2 of 2 is equal to y1, no, y2 of 1 plus delta t times k1 there, so delta t times f2 of t1 y vector 1. So that's equal to what? Well, y2, y2 is equal to this guy here at time equal to 1. That's equal to 1 plus delta t, delta t was 0 0.1, right? That's up here times the right-hand side, the right-hand side we just calculated, that's 1. Okay, good. So that gives me 1.1. That would be my solution here. And what's my time at this moment now? So t2 is equal to 0 0.1, 0 0.1, right? That's t1 plus delta t. Okay, that's my first interior point. On to the next one. y3 at 2 is y3 at 1 plus delta t times f3 t1 y vector 1. y3 at 1 is this guy here. It's 1. Delta t is still 0 0.1 times f2. f2 here is 2. So times 2. So that's equal to 
1.2. And then finally, the last interior point y4, 2, has to be equal to y4, 1, plus delta t times f4 evaluated at t1, y1. So that's equal to the y value is 1 plus delta t is 0 0.1 times the f, the right hand side. We evaluated that as 3. So 0 0.1 times 3 gives me 1.3. 1.3. Okay, so that kind of concludes the application of the forward Euler method. And now I have to apply the boundary conditions. Apply boundary conditions. So boundary conditions were squeezed up here, right, y1. So y1 at 2 is just equal to 1. So I can write the 1 in here. And then the other boundary condition is up here. So y5 of 2 is equal to y4 of 2 plus delta x times t2. Okay, so now let's look at those values. Where do I get those four? y4 is this value here. That's my y4. And my t2 is up there is 0 0.1. So that would mean this is equal to 1.3 plus delta x is 1 times 0 0.1, which would make this 1.4. 1.4. So that's my solution after one step. Let's do one more step. So we're going to repeat this. So n is equal to 2. Let me take these values here and just copy them over. Copy. Move them into the right spot. There we go. And we just have to repeat the procedure now. The first step is calculate the right hand side at every one of the interior points. So we have to start out with F, to start out with F2 at T2 using the Y values at time step 2, which is equal to minus x2 squared times y2 minus y1 at time level 2 divided by delta x plus x2 plus t2. Okay, let's substitute in the values. Um, x2, here is i equal to 2, here's my x, that's 1. So minus 1 squared times y2 minus y1. y2, 1.1 minus y1, that's 1. So times 1.1 minus 1 divided by delta x, which is 1, plus x2 is 1, plus t2 is 0 0.1, right? That's this current time level, t2. All right then, so we got 1.1 minus 1 is 0.1 times minus 1 is negative 0.1 plus 0.1 is 0 plus 1 is 1. So that value here is still, we don't need it at the first point. This value at the second point is equal to 1. F3 at t2, y vector 2 is equal to minus x 3 squared times y3 2 minus y2 2 divided by delta x plus x3 plus t2. t2. I want to get ahead of myself. t2. Substitute in the values. The x3 value is 2 minus 2 squared times y3 minus y2. Here's my y3, here's my y2. So 1.2 minus 1.1 divided by delta x is 1, plus 
x3, that is 2, plus t2, which is 0 0.1. So that's um, <clears throat> what we got here, 0 0.1 times negative 4, that's negative 0.4, plus 0.1 is negative 0.3, plus 2, that's equal to 1.7. Okay, let's put it in the table, 1.7. And then finally, f4, t2, y vector 2, is equal to minus x4 squared times y4, 2, minus y3, 2, divided by delta x, plus x4, plus t2, with the values x4 is 3, minus 3 squared times y4 minus y3, y4 minus y3, 1.3 minus 1.2, divided by delta x, which is 1, plus 3 plus t, 0 0.1, that's equal to 0 0.1 times 9, it's negative 0.9, plus 0.1 is negative 0.8, plus 3, that is 2.2. 2.2, and I don't need to calculate the f for the boundary points because they have the boundary conditions. Okay, so then let's use our k1, and we find that application of our k1, y2 at step time step 3. So let's put the t in here. So t of 3 is equal to 0 0.1 plus delta t, so 0 0.2. So y2 at time level 3 is equal to y2 time level 2 plus delta t times f2 t2 y vector 2. That's equal to y2 at i equal to 2 is 1.1. 1. 1.1 1. 1. 1 plus delta t is 0. 0.1 times f2 and the f2 was 1 times 1. So that's equal to 1.2. So let me write this here. The y is equal to 1.2. Next point. y3 at 3 is equal to y3 at time step 2 plus delta t times f3 time level 2 y vector at 2. That's equal to what? Okay, the y value at i equal to 3 time equal to 2 is 1.2 plus delta t 0 0.1 times the right hand side at i equal to 3 that's 1.7 1 1.7 so we have 1.2 plus 0 0.17 it's 1.37 1 1.37 then the fourth point, y4, 3, is equal to y4, 2, plus delta t times f4 at t2, y vector at 2, is equal to, well, the y value is 1.3. 1 1.3 1 plus delta t is still 0 0.1, times the f value at i equal to 4, that was 2.2. So we've got 1.3 plus 0 0.22, that's 1.52, 1 1.52. So that updates the interior values, and then we have to apply the boundary conditions. The first one at the left is y1 at time level 3 is still equal to just 1. Right? That's this one, for any time the value is equal to 1. So I can write my 1 in here. And then the value at the right bound, y4 at time level 3, is equal to y4 at time level 3, plus delta x times t at time level 3. So what are these values? So let's use here. So I need y4, that's this guy here, right, 1.52. And I need the new time, t3, that's 0 0.2. So that's my t3, and this is my y4. So I get that's equal to 1.52 plus delta x is 1, 
times T3, that's 0 0.2. So that would be equal to 1.72. 1.72. And that has now updated the entire solution domain in space from time level 2 to time level 3. And I just want to point out again, you have to update the entire mesh to the new time level before you can advance to the next time level. That was the same with systems of ODEs, uh, but here now we can talk about a mesh. So every mesh point value in the interior has to be updated to the new time level, and then the boundaries have to be updated as well by application of the boundary conditions. Thank you for watching.